Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett from uh, Miami Broadcasting from Miami, Florida. Today we have another in a series of Larkin Hospital hangouts in the neurosurgical channel. Uh, Richard, Dr. Richard Mandel is going to speak today about Andes Curris, something which I haven't heard about. Maybe some of the other panelists haven't. First, we're going to start off as usual by introducing the panel, and then we'll turn it over to Richard. Hello, Jesse. Hi, everyone. It's Jesse Contra. I'm a graduate student coming to you uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, welcome, Jesse. And Thanks. Manuel. Hello, this is Manuel from Spain. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to join you all. And you're a neurologist, correct? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a neurologist, yeah. And practicing in Oviedo? Right. Okay, thank you. And yeah, man, just by the way, Manuel just organized a four day hangout conference. Uh, wow. Cool. It's tough. Okay, uh, Matt Mohammed, are you there? Hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed. Yes, I'm here, Dr. Bennett. Pleasure to be with you today as well. Great. Welcome, Mohammed. And my main man, Simon. Hi, everyone. This is Simon from Tokyo. Nice to see you. Okay, welcome, Simon. Okay, Richard, it's all yours. All right. Uh, let me try to bring these up on screen share a minute. Okay. Um, well, we always have problems. <clears throat> there you go. It's, it's there. On All right. Paper. All right. Um, Andine's curse is a, uh, a a reference to some literature and and mythology um, that kind of uh, was really well il illustrated in Frank Vertosik's book. Frank Vertosik's a neurosurgeon who was trained at the University of Pittsburgh, and he wrote a book about. It's probably about 20 years ago now called When the Air Hits Your Brain. And in one of these stories, he talked, he mentioned Andine's curse. And what can happen is that while operating in the, in the fourth ventricle, in the floor of the fourth ventricle, there is a lot of autonomic control. And that's where the, like, pneumotaxic and apneustic centers are in the brainstem for control of involuntary breathing. Um, and so there are areas of conscious voluntary b b breathing in the s hemispheres, but they kind of run much f more ventral and lateral in the um, brainstem and the, and the spinal cord. But the autonomic control, which, which has all those, you know, what's it called, the uh, Aaron Brewer reflex and the hematactic centers that, that detect pH or, or, you know, carbon dioxide are in the floor of the fourth ventricle. And what became evident was that uh, Vertosic wrote about a, a patient who had had a fourth ventricular tumor removed and they actually had an injury such that they became ventilator dependent permanently because Andine's curse is the loss of, of your autonomic control of respiration so the curse was that you, you could never sleep again you would have to stay awake at all times to remember to breathe. Um, so this is, this is a picture from, uh, from Wikipedia of John, John Williams. Uh, it, it's an old picture from, it, it was just mentioned in there, but this is supposed to be a depiction of Andine. Now Andine is supposed to be a sea nymph uh, which may have, uh, you know, I don't know that much about the mythology of it all, but at any rate, uh, 
sea nymphs apparently don't have a human soul and they need to marry a human to obtain a soul. And Andine married someone with the proviso that if he was unfaithful to her, he would be stricken with her curse. And her curse was, in fact, uh, the loss of the ability, the loss of autonomic function. The first of which was, you know, the inability to breathe without thinking about it voluntarily. So, what became interesting is that the obex, which is right here, it's where the the floor of the fourth ventricle is at its lowest. And so around the 1900s, um, when um, um, ventricul ventriculography and myelography and cisternal uh, dye challenges were done with, with radiograph, you know, with filming, um, I think it mostly was around the 19... 1919, 1920, um, but the obex was the lowest part of the um, ventricular system that you could see in one of these dye-infused studies. So the obex became the, the landmark for a lot of things. So when we talked many months ago about stereotactic surgery, if you remember, the Japanese were really the first to build a um, stereotactic frame. And they um, they often would would um, do types of dye studies. But remember, those frames were never used on humans. But it was Spiegel and Weiss at Temple University, and that was like 1947 when they first started applying their frame, which was the spiegel weiss frame, on the humans, the obex was the point at which you, you saw the dye lowest that was still in the brain of the, the central nervous system. And the obex was what led you down into the central canal of the spinal cord. And, you know, the dye... The dye would go down there, but where you lost, last saw it would be the obex, which would be an outpouching. So <clears throat> what happened was that it became apparent with children especially because things like choroid plexus papillomas and choroid plexus tumors, and you, you remember the choroid plexus was, is, runs through the ventricular system and produces CSF. With those type of tumors, there was often manipulation of the floor of the fourth ventricle. So actually, in the in operations in the cerebellum or in the, the ventricular system near the bottom of the fourth ventricle, a lot of really unusual things can happen as side effects. Things like akinetic mutism and... Um, 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 a, a locked-in syndrome can also occur, but the the one of the f most frightening things that can, can occur is this Andine's curse. Now, it does seem that pulmonologists will call Andine's curse um, like a central. Uh, it, uh, areolar deficiency because the, there's no the inspiratory cycle's gone and and um, oftentimes these are congenital problems so if you remember diseases like Hirschsprung's disease where the bowel has no neural intervention if you think of Hirschsprung's disease and it goes all the way up the cord well, there's no neural intervention, innervation in the uh, obex either, and so these children are born with no breathing responses, and you know, in the pre-ventilator, you know, they lived a very short time. 
So there's a congenital form of Ondine's curse, but m more importantly to neurosurgeons, there is a uh, iatrogenic cause of Ondine's curse, which is manipulation within the floor of the fourth ventricle. And like I mentioned before, a kinetic mutism where kids seem to be comatose for a brief time, could be a week to 10 days sometimes, but you, when you arouse them, they have, they track with their eyes, they do swallow if you feed them, um, but uh, otherwise, they're in a w weird way, very un unresponsive. So anyway, the obex, which is right here where the lip of the fourth vent ventricle meets in the midline, that, that's kind of a, a term that's going away. You don't see it mentioned much. Here, here's a cutaway diagram in a neuroanatomy text where the obex is still mentioned, but the more and more I look, the less I see the obex referred to. Because it was a really a very common point of, of in stereotaxis for many years. Now, um, I have a couple of cine videos, but I, I, I don't know how to show them on the um, with PowerPoint. But I, I could, you know, give you their links, and they kind of illustrate the obex really really very well. And the point of this whole obsession with the obex was that, um, um, you know, a lot of times we just don't think about all the involuntary or inhibitory things that go on. And, you know, the neurologists have said for years that the inhibitory patterns that we have are much more energy consumptive than the excitatory responses that we generate. And so, for instance, in the spinal cord, where glycine is, inhibit is an inhibitory transmitter, there's nine times more inhibitory uh, glycine uh, synapses and connections than there are for excitatory channels. So, in a way, you have to turn off more muscles than you 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 activate for a movement by inhibition. So, you know, people s sometimes say that when you're young, uh, your body takes care of you, but when you get old, you take care of your body, and you never seem to do as good a job. And it, it's a lot of it is because there's so much that goes on that's unconscious. And um, so there's a lot of good physiology published about the uh, inspiratory and expiratory autonomics of res respiration. But if you look back to the 1970s and 80s, Oscar Sugar, who was a neurosurgeon, published a lot of them in JAMA and also in the Journal of Neurosurgery. Now the pulmonologists have really seemed to uh, have gotten much more involved in the, pneumota in the pneumotaxic and chemotactic receptor areas. But if, if you look at those things, Oscar Sugar is the person that wrote, wrote the most about them, at least within the last 40 or 50 years. So... That was really all I had on Andy's curse. I just thought it was interesting. It was a nice short topic, given the uh, the move this week. So that was really about it for that. Um, and like I said, next week I was hoping we would talk about you know how to localize disc herniations on films, especially MRI. Very good, Richard. Uh, interesting from the point of view of neuroanatomy, but also history of neurosurgery, which you seem to be pretty well steeped in. Um, well, Oscar Sugar was a big, he was a very famous neurosurgeon, so it's just interesting that, you know, people, Sugar was writing about this 40 years ago, and now, you know, it's really been co-opted 
probably correctly by the pulmonologists, but you know. Just okay, control. was he? Uh, you can get off the screen share, Richard. Was he an uh, illustrator also, uh, or just basically wrote about on Dean's course initially? Sugar? Oh no, he he's written tons of art. He was a department chairman. He was a big deal. Oh okay. Okay, well I guess we'll start with Manuel since he's uh, steeped in the uh, neurosciences. Manuel, do you have any questions for Richard or comments? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a comment. Yeah, I I find very uh, interesting from the anatomical point of view, uh, when you think uh, that uh, some patients who have a damage in brain stem in the, in the floor of the, of the fourth ventricle, how some of these patients develop locked-in syndrome where they can't move, so the motor pathways are damaged, and how these patients typically don't have respiratory problems. And, yeah. and, and, and the, the same patients, uh, very, very similar localization, they develop respiratory problems. So it looks quite uh, um, conflictive between these concepts, but I think we, we need to look into the neuroanatomy very, with, very, with much detail to understand how these differences may occur in patients who have similar lesions. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, that's, a, um, that's a good point, and I think that the, um, in De Jong's, like, an old, I looked at an old copy of De Jong's, the neurologic examination mm -hmm. from, like, the late 1980s, and mm -hmm. what they were describing was that with, with people that had that lacked an injury to the superior orbital projections, that mm -hmm. those were the people that could look, that would have ocular vertical, pre preservation of vertical eye movement right. with locked-in syndrome. But, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's right. You know, you don't see, you often don't see respiratory problems with a lot of these patients. For instance, you know, a, a, a very common operation in the fourth, uh, right near the fourth ventricle is, you know, the decompression of Chiari malformations. And there's a very low incidence of any kind of side effects with Chiari, decompressing Chiari malformations, because it's mostly a bony operation now. But... In years past, especially with the group at UCLA, they would do a lot of plugging of the obex and things like that. And they they did have some morbidity from from manipulation in the fourth ventricle and putting muscle plugs into the obex so that that uh, CSF pulsation wasn't um, what they call a water hammer mechanism. But yeah, you're right. The anatomy isn't the anatomy as I learned it in the late '80s is completely being revised now with all the the mapping of the and tractography. But I'm sure that the answers in the somewhere in the injury to the tracts themselves right. rather than the nuclei, because when when I look at at the neurological exam from Dijon, they mentioned the tractus solitarius, so many different nuclei that it didn't, it doesn't make clear sense. I'm sure it's injury to the tracts mm -hmm. that causes the issues, but I, I certainly, I, I, I don't, I don't know the answer. I'm just suspecting that as we get better with the tractography, we'll have a better idea. Okay. Yeah. Thank Richard, you. Richard, uh, Mohammed, or Simon, or Jesse, any questions? Oh, ben, ben, a late arrival? Excellent yes. presentation, Dr. Mendel. Thank you for sure, an sure. interesting case. Yeah, there's very few of these cases presented in neurosurgical literature as complications. I mean, it doesn't happen very often at all, but as you can imagine, when it does happen, it's a... a 
an absolute disaster. Uh, so, Richard, you're called to the uh, after the baby's delivered, probably right away, right? Well, I don't, I don't ever see this. You know, the baby, the babies that have something like this tend to have some a type of congenital form, right. like a, what we used to call a form frust of Hirschsprung's disease, where the entire enteric system has no innervation. That's mm -hmm. somebody that may not have any innervation of the the uh, pneumotaxis, the breathing center at all. But, you know, a, where neurosurgeons see it is usually pediatric neurosurgeons who see a lot of fourth ventricular tumors like ependymomas and um, um, lesions like ependymomas or cord plexus papillomas. As an adult neurosurgeon, Luckily, you're hardly ever going to see these, but if you're in, in the fourth ventricle, it's something you're going to, that, that, that's going to come to mind. <laughs> well, this probably has more to do with the Chiari syndrome, but is there any prenatal testing, protein testing, that you can kind of be aware that, oh, okay, we have a problem with child coming? Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there is. This is, this is a really, really rare rare phenomena, mm -hmm. really rare, but, uh, you know, there, there's lots of, you know, with the prenatal testing and all the talk right now on about amniotic fluid and all that, I'm sure there's things going on, but, you know, still, like with things like amniotic fluid testing, you still have to remain pretty skeptical because, by the time the baby's born, 90% of that amniotic fluid is just urine anyway. So uh, I, I'm not the expert on amniotic fluid. Yeah. Uh, have you seen any patients in your practice, uh, patients that are still living and functioning with no. uh, these Chris? No, no. I, I mean, thank God I, I've never seen on these curse. Okay. I mean, it's rare. I don't remember the numbers, but I don't. I don't think. I don't think there's more than. In all the medical literature together, I don't think there's more than eight hundred or a thousand okay. reported cases. Okay. So uh, it, it it was just interesting because of. You know, we think so little about all all, all the autonomics. And somebody at Queen Square once said, this woman once said to me that, you know, we think the central nervous system is really, really complex, and it is, but she said once we know more about the central nervous system, we're probably going to find out that the peripheral nervous system is much more complex than we ever thought as well. And I think it's kind of true because we have so many things that are done autonomically with what, like things like the breathing and and the uh, the uh, voluntary breathing being ventral and lateral, when the central breathing or autonomic breathing is all pretty much midline. You know, it's just interesting. So, um, what was I going to say? I, was, I had some kind of comment. Um, well, Manuel, Manuel Menendez, have you ever seen a case of uh, on these courses? Or have you heard of it? I hadn't even heard about it. No, I honestly, honestly I, I've never diagnosed any patient with uh, Ondian syndrome. Okay. Um, but, but I have heard about, I have listened about, but uh, I have no direct experience. No, I don't have an experience to share. Okay. Okay, very good. Simon, uh, or anyone have any comments, yeah. questions? Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, I, I was just clarifying Dr. Manuel's question uh, because uh, he has a question uh, that why in Larkin syndrome, uh, like in similar, with similar anat anatomical lesions, do not have respiratory problems. I think, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elongated area, you know, where you have, you know, on the top you have the peripheral chemoreceptors and in the middle you have central chemoreceptors on the bottom. You have the muscular receptors. 
on the other hand you have stretch receptors and the irritant receptors and the and the respiratory central receptors on the top medulla and pons it's a very broad area and i don't know exactly what happens in locked in syndrome but uh, you know it, it depends on the lesions uh, where exactly you know the damage is and uh, if that's why sometimes the it's not a global phenomenon that you know everything has to happen in locked in syndrome you know if this thing, if the some some areas are spared maybe you know they are you know you may not see it that yeah it that's it, it, it make any sense here very that's very high very elegant anatomy there and it's it's so compact that i just have to mm -hmm. believe that there are, you know, we may we may think a nucleus is there, but I don't know that the location of the nucleus is the important part of the lesion. The lesion may not be near the nucleus. It may be in a tract relatively far away that results in that dysfunction. That's like, you know, when you think about the visual system and the visual tract and you think of Myers loop, I mean you know, you get elegant, you get large changes in vision with small injuries to the visual pathway, the loops of the, the tracks that, uh, you know, it's just it's something elegant that it, it's just not well mapped out yet, I don't think. Well, Richard, that area is so compact, you always have to use the microscope when you're, you're, you're dealing in that area? Yeah. No, yeah, nobody in their right mind would be operating in the in, a, in the ventricular system without a, a, a scope or, or a microscope, and an endoscopy or a microscope, yeah. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, and good luck on your move over to St. <laughs> Pete's. All right. And uh, we'll see you next week, and thank you, panel, everybody, for coming out. Yeah, so thank next you. week will be a really practical one. Okay. Discs are so common. They may not be fascinating, but knowing where they are is kind of it's kind of easy to figure out once you have a good framework. Yeah, I think all the doctors will attest to that. You see a lot of disc problems yeah. in, in every area of the hospital. So, okay, Richard, thank you very much. All right.